Bien. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Bienvenue à cette activité co-organisée par le département des droits internationaux de l'Institut des hautes études internationales et du développement de Genève et l'Institut des droits internationaux. Don't worry if you don't understand French, uh, I will continue the English. But uh, you know that the, both institutions are bilingual. Um, I pay a lot of attention to keep the bilingual character of our two institutions. So that uh, when I will give the floor to the uh, participants here, feel free to speak either English or French. J'aurai la tentation de continuer en français, mais je le ferai. So, uh, I start again and I particularly welcome the members of the International Law Commission who are, I know are, they are working hard also in Geneva. So that's interesting that the uh, ILC uh, also has its uh, headquarters in Geneva, like the Institut de Droit International. So, as I said, welcome to this event co-organized by the Geneva Graduate Institute and the Institut de Droit International. It's a particular pleasure to see you, I would say, again, because uh, obviously for the reasons that we all know and we have suffered, we were unable to organize this kind of event uh, the last years. Uh, and the purpose of this is to present the work of the Institut de Droit International. So we did it uh, for our prior sessions, uh, and we are doing it now once again. As you know, the Institute of International Law is the oldest institution uh, in the field of international law. Next year, we will celebrate our 150th anniversary. And we will have our uh, session next time in Angers in Paris. So uh, our last session was last year, uh, and for the reasons that I mentioned, it was an online session for the first time in the history of the Institute of International Law. Originally, uh, it was planned to have it in Beijing, and uh, the session was presided over uh, by President uh, uh, Hankin Shue, uh, the judge of the International Court of Justice, as you know. Uh, during the last session, we, uh, we were very active, um, and probably because it was an online session. Um, we adopted four resolutions. Uh, I will mention them in the order they were adopted. The, one, uh, the first one was on epidemics, pandemics, and international law under the guidance and the work of our rapporteur, rapporteur uh, Shinya Murase. Uh, the second one was the resolution on the limits to evolutive interpretation of the constituent instruments of the organizations within the United Nations system by their internal organs, also under the guidance and the work of uh, our uh, rapporteur. Uh, Manish Asanjani. The third resolution was on human rights and private international law. Uh, our last rapporteur was uh, uh, our confrere Fausto Poca. And uh, the fourth resolution adopted was on territorial administration by the United Nations and other uh, international institutions authorized by the United Nations. Nation. So I have the pleasure to welcome all of our rapporteurs. The last resolution was adopted 
under the guidance and the work of our rapporteur, uh, Alexandro Sicilianos. So uh, for the sake of earning time, I will not introduce our distinguished uh, rapporteur. They are well known. Uh, I would just uh, like to say that um, thanks to their uh, expedient work, um, their guidance, the Institute was able to adopt these very important four resolutions. The Institute also pursues its activities, keeping in mind the, the current challenges uh, that the international law faces. And in this regard, we created three new commissions. Uh, one on the applicability of international law to cyber activities, and the rapporteur is our confrere von Law. Another one, which is the follow-up of the resolution on epidemics uh, and international law, is on uh, mitigating techniques, vaccines and medicines in dealing with epidemics uh, and international law with a particular emphasis on intellectual property rights. Um, the rapporteur is our confrere, uh, Edward Quacua, who is well known here in Geneva. And the last, resolution, the, the last uh, new commission that we created is on the place of social justice in international law, and the rapporteur is our confrere, uh, Marty Koskiniemi. I have also to mention that um, uh, in just some weeks ago, the 1st of March, uh, the Institute adopted the declaration on the aggression in Ukraine. That was a declaration that was adopted uh, online. Uh, with uh, 110 votes in favor and five abstentions. Uh, it is uncommon that the Institute adopts uh, this kind of uh, declarations, but it was considered that uh, there was a need to do it, and that was in line with uh, what the Institute had done in the past in 2003. It also adopted, uh, that was the prior declaration adopted by the Institute, on uh, the questions concerning the use of force uh, in international law. So, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, because uh, we have uh, very four important presentations, I will give the floor to Shinya Murase, who was the rapporteur on epidemics, pandemics, and international law. And I would also like to thank you, thank him particularly, because uh, that was one of the fastest resolutions adopted in the history of international law. So when the COVID-19 situation arose, the Institute uh, decided to create this uh, commission under the proposal of uh, Shinya Murase. And thanks to him, we have this resolution that he will uh, introduced to us. Um, thank you, Professor Cohen, for your very kind introduction. I'd like to express my uh, admiration for his br brilliant leadership as Secretary General of the Institute. I'm happy to see Dr. Manusha Sanjani right next to me. Um, Manush and I worked together as legal officers of the UN Codification Division back in early 1980s. While I did not last more than two years there, Manush survived three, 32 years, <laughs> 32 years <laughs> becoming ultimately the, the director of the, of the codification division and the secretary to the International Law Commission. So um, <clears throat> regarding the topic on epidemics and international law, one morning uh, in March 2020, when COVID-19 started bringing unprecedented calamities to the world, I came up with an idea that the international lawmaking may be urgently needed for prevention and control of epidemics. I proposed this topic to the International Law Commission, ILC, <clears throat> of which I have been a member since 2009. I stressed that because of the urgency of the topic, uh, the RC must deal with it as a priority topic by remote meetings and email exchanges. 
However, the reaction of its members were not uh, very enthusiastic, except for a few members, and I was very much disappointed. But you may recall the lines from, from the movie, Sound of Music, when, when the Lord closes the door, somewhere he opens the window. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, there was an invitation a few days later uh, by Professor Marcel Cohen, a Secretary General of the Institute, addressed, <clears throat> addressed to all the IDI members to offer an idea to cope with, with the situation caused by COVID-19. Thereupon, I proposed this topic to IDI with a brief concept paper. The IDI Bureau, led by then President Shue Hanchin, judge of ICJ moved very quickly and established the 12th Commission on Epidemics and International Law, to which uh, Professor Pokal uh, joined as a member. And uh, <clears throat> so it has proven that the IDI is not yet a nursery home for elderly international lawyers. Moved by the sense of extreme urgency, the Treves Commission completed the report of the, report of the Commission by December 2020 to be, to, to be ready for discussion at the IDI's 80th um, online Beijing conference in August, September 2021. And in this process, Professor Jean-Luc Birch, a uh, former uh, adv legal advisor of WHO uh, offered me a great deal of support and uh, <clears throat> very much uh, appreciate, I appreciate him uh, very much. The IDI resolution epidemics, pandemics and international law consisting of the preamble and 17 articles was adopted on 31 August 2021. It is hoped that this resolution will be the basis for elaborating a future convention on the topic. Well, the WHO law is quite an autonomous law, but it is not a sealed or self-contained regime. It is an open system of law and it exists and functions in relation to other fields of international law. Obviously, epidemics touch on uh, every facet of human life. In any event, a study on the law of epidemics should avoid a single issue approach. Rather, it is necessary to look into the gaps in and linkages with relevant rules of international law. I served as special rapporteur for the topic on the protection of the atmosphere at ILC. And I find that the normative characteristics of epidemics resemble those of the atmosphere. Thus, modeled after guideline nine of the ILC guidelines on the protection of the atmosphere, article seven of this uh, IDI resolution in ep epidemics provides for interrelationship among re relevant rules. This is also the reason why the experts of general international law of our institute, who are not necessarily the experts of international health law, can and should contribute to the international lawmaking efforts for the prevention and control of epidemics. I will now touch on some of the important elements of the resolu resolution. First, on the use of, of terms. Throughout the resolution, the term epidemics is uh, employed. The WHO constitution seeks to stimulate and advance work to eradicate uh, epidemic and other disease, that's Article 2. It also refers to infectious disease and communicable disease. These include, but not, not limited to, smallpox, tuberculosis, cholera, plague, pest, yellow fever, polio, 
HIV, AIDS, influenza, SARS, MERS, Zika, and COVID-19. The term epidemics is preferred, which reflects what is commonly used in the legal literature, literature to in, relating to infectious disease outbreaks. The popular expression of pandemics uh, is avoided, which does not seem to be a legal term in the context of WHO, apart from the pandemic influen influenza. There has been no systematic uh, practice at WHO in the use of, uh, of the term pandemic. Uh, it is true that uh, WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros, declared COVID-19 as a pandem pandemic on 11 March 2020, but it was merely a factual statement for the media without giving any legal definition or criteria. Note that there is a 1986 WHA resolution on tobacco, tobacco, tobacco and health, which characterizes smoking as a pandemic. There is also a UN General Assembly resolution, which describes HIV AIDS as a pandemic. It is therefore with some reluctance to include the term pandemic in the title of the resolution but it has been decided to do so since the term is now used widely in public statements and literature. But it is just for the title and it is not intended to affect the draft articles. As a basic, basic principles, the IDI resolution first describes that protection of persons from epidemics is the common concern of humankind. It, is cl it clarifies that the project is for the purpose of protection of persons, which takes human-oriented approach rather than the state-centric approach. Other basic principles mentioned in the resolution are human rights, primary obligation of states to exercise due diligence, international cooperation based on solidarity, of international community. For substantive obligations of states, the IDI draft articles take three temporal phases before the epidemic, <clears throat> during the epidemic, and after the epidemic, each of which would address legal measures to be taken by states to protect persons, communities, and states from epidemics. This approach has been modeled after the IOC topic on the protection of persons in the event of disasters, of which Mr. Valencia Uspina served as special rapporteur. too. Such an approach would allow us to identify concrete legal issues at the different stages of an epidemic. For pre-epidemic pre stage was particularly stressed by the importance of promoting epidemic prevention culture, similar to nuclear safety culture in, in the nuclear, nuclear field. For the purpose of during epidemics, uh, obligations of the states affected, affected states and those of other states are provided separately and in detail. For, for the post-epidemic phase, the issues of review, responsibility of state and international organizations, and international dispute settlement are provided. Finally, I'm a bit unhappy about the lack of practice in the Institute regarding the commentaries to the resolution, resolutions. Commentaries are the integral part of the draft articles. I cannot think of any draft articles without commentaries. Draft articles may be the bones of, of a body, while commentaries are the flesh, blood, and nerves. Without commentaries, draft articles are merely the skeleton. The Travis, Travis Commission worked out a set of commentaries by December 2021, but I was told that the, the, we have no way but to publish it as a private publication because the IDI yearbook would not publish it 
for lack of time in the IDI conferences to discuss the commentaries. I think we can overcome this by discussing the commentaries remotely and through email exchanges. I hope that in the future, the IDI will make it a practice to publish commentaries in the yearbook. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shinya, for this uh, very clear and concise um, presentation of the resolution on epidemics and pandemics and international law that we adopted. Uh, your message concerning commentaries to resolutions is well taken. Uh, I speak uh, under the control of the members of the ALC who are also present, and as you are. Uh, and there are some specificities of the work of the ILC and of the work of the Institute. Um, uh, there are some uh, particular problems in adopting commentaries like uh, the ILC does, but uh, we have been encouraging the, the production by the rapporteur uh, of commentaries, and indeed, uh, I have to say that myself, as a prior rapporteur, I, I did it. And it is true that uh, we published it uh, not as an official publication of the <laughs> Institute, but uh, with the support of the Institute and uh, also the resolution of the quality of the parties in investment arbitration, uh, internet and private life. Uh, our uh, confrere rapporteur also published um, I look forward to reading your commentaries uh, soon, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. And now I give the floor to our next rapporteur. Manush, you have the floor. Thank you, Marcelo. I also want to pay tribute to uh, Marcelo Cohen as a, a visionary secretary general. It is important. This is an old institution. Uh, to be able to, to have a vision to, to make it relevant to the future. So as you notice that the Institute has worked with very current topics, that is the pandemics or epidemics, but also deals with some topics that are not so current, but they have some, they're more classical, but they have some current interests, such as the scope of dynamic interpretation, and here is in the context of constituent instruments of international organizations. What I'm going to do, I'm not going to go over the resolution. It's a rather a short resolution. One of the things you will see is that depending on what the subject is about, the resolution would reflect that. Some, some resolutions reflect more, uh, uh, such as legislative texts, and some do not. And, and you will see this is a topic that does not lend itself to that kind of a resolution. But I would like to, to speak to you about some of the findings both factual findings and those that they have normative expression in them in the report of the rapporteur and the discussions that came out of the commission. First, the, the original topic, the title of the topic was broad. It included international organizations in plural, with particular reference to the UN system. As we studied, we realized that not all international organizations are the same. They are not established the same way, nor do they operate the same way. Even the concept of what is an international organization has evolved. The United Nations and its specialized agencies as international organizations are intergovernmental organizations established by treaties. They have states as their members, and they are a product of a particular period in international relations. And this is an important issue to which I will come back. But the term international organizations now include other organizations not necessarily established by treaties, and they have members that are not entirely states. They are more like public-private partnership. They have different operative rules, and the practice is different from the organizations under the UN system. In view of the diversity and numerous international organizations, it was not useful to combine all international organizations under the same umbrella. It is for this reason that the resolution is limited to the practice of the UN and the organization within the UN system, that is, as a specialized agencies, that they can all be combined as an identifiable and coherent group of international organizations, more or less with a similar regime. 
The topic is not about the rules of interpretation as applied to the constituent instruments of international organization. Those rules have already been set forth by articles 31 to 33 of the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties with the caveat provided for constituent instruments in Article, in article 5 of the Convention. So it is essentially a narrow topic whether there are limits to the dynamic interpretation of constituent instruments of international organizations by internal organs of these organizations. The topic is also a practical one. It's based on the actual practice of these organizations that are routinely confronted with an endless stream of novel legal issues. <clears throat> the interpretive practice of these organizations are not theoretical. They're not even identified as the legal act of interpretation. That's the way they operate, they perform their functions. You will recall that I said earlier that the UN and the organizations within the UN system are the products of a particular time in history. And this has shaped the way these organizations were viewed and expected to conduct themselves. The legislative history of the constituent instrument of many of these organizations and supported by their practice demonstrate their unique character that these international organizations are established on the basis of what Goodrich and Hamburg referred to in 1949 as the principle of voluntary cooperation between the states in the promotion of common objectives. Principle of voluntary cooperation. This view is supported by the legislative history of the charter and the practice of the organization. There's no provision in the charter concerning its interpretation. This was not a result of an oversight. On the contrary, it was discussed at the San Francisco conference and the decision was made against such a provision. The legislative history of the charter reveals that the question of interpretation of the charter was considered carefully in more than one context. So the drafters of the charter deliberately left out any procedure for authoritative interpretation of the charter. The committee that was entrusted to address this question did provide that if there is a dispute between two states regarding the interpretation of the charter, they can refer that to the international court. If there is a disagreement, divergent views among various organs of the UN, the committee recommended three options. One is the uh, advisory opinion from the court. Second is the ad hoc committee of jurists. And the third is a joint conference. This was as far as the committee could agree on. The committee made a caveat. It is stated that it is to be understood, of course, that if an interpretation made by an organ of the UN or by a committee of jurists is not generally acceptable, it will be without binding force. Now, remember the word generally acceptable. This expression means that there is no requirement of unanimity. The word generally acceptable anticipates that there may be states that they will not agree with a particular interpretation, but their disagreement will not undermine the authoritative character of interpretation. The committee also made a distinction between two types of interpretive, authoritative interpretation. It stated that in case where it is desired to establish an authoritative interpretation as a precedent for the future, as a precedent for the future, it may always be done or accomplished by recourse to procedure for amendment. So amendment was really the one that creates precedent. Nothing else does. The specialized agencies also routinely interpret their constituent instruments internally in case of a dispute between an interpretation. They have different mechanisms for review of internal interpretations. So theoretically, there seem to be no limits to the, on the discretionary power of security councils, uh, of the specialized agencies to interpret dynamically their constituent instruments. If there is no objection, this is the caveat, if there is no objections, from their membership. The practice of the World Bank and the IMF in the interpretation of the constituent instrument is also unique and autonomous. The constitutions of both organizations were adopted in 1944 at Bretton Woods. The Bretton Woods Agreement empowers the executive directors 
of these organizations to interpret agreements, either formally or informally in the court of the operation of the bank. I'd like to read something, a passage from a former general counsel of IMF, Mr. Hexner, in 1950s with regard to the interpretation of the constituent instrument of the World Bank, the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, and the IMF by the International Court. He said, apart from very uncommon and refined questions which may arise in the application of certain provisions of the Convention on Privileges and Immunities of the Specialized Agencies, it is difficult to conceive of cases in which the three organizations would resort to requesting the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice on questions of interpretation. The internal, internal procedure of interpretation in these organizations is obligatory and cannot be affected by the organization's right to request advisory opinion. So the capacity of international organizations to interpret their constituent instruments without oversight extends to the capacity to determine the limits to that competence. This is similar to the principle of competence de la competence of international tribunals. But international organizations have been careful in interpreting their constituent instruments. It is presumed that if international organizations fail to interpret their constituent instruments consistent with principles of justice and international law, as provided in Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the Charter, and in the absence of support and cooperation among their membership, that would lead to their dissolution. One other factor appears to have motivated the drafters of the Charter, and by analogy, the constituent instruments of specialized agencies. That is that international organizations can only function if there is general agreement among the members of these organizations on their direction and operation. Paradoxically, outside oversight of the interpretation of the constituent instruments without the consent of the membership will be counterproductive. Therefore, it is this essential requirement of cooperation embedded in the structure and manner in which these organizations operate that provides an internal control mechanism which addresses their interpretive needs and provide corrective uh, movement is needed. Now, the resolution that you will see has incorporated these understandings that I refer to you, I, I explained to you. But I'd like to just go to the operative part and just explain very briefly of, of what that is. Is that the, you see there's nothing um, evolutionary about it. But it does have some things that what I explained to you is that the founding is the foundations of these uh, normative expressions, is that international organizations may, and in fact, there was some discussion in the answer to they say, we have to use shall or must, but may carries the same, the same uh, understanding. They may resort to uh, dynamic, evolutive, there was a decision to have it evolutive, but it's the same thing. I just find the expression dynamic much easier on my pronunciation rather than evolutive. Uh, they may resort to dynamic interpretation to fill gaps, not only to fill gaps, uh, the ambiguity, but also when there's an absence of something in the constituent instrument. There is uh, uh, recognition that Articles 31 to 32 of the Vienna Convention, uh, with the caveat in Article 5, regulate or apply to the interpretation of the constituent instruments. And these are the where sort of you see a bit of limits that, that it, it comes in very softly. That uh, dynamic interpretations uh, should be uh, consistent with the with these instruments, and particularly with the object and purpose. So you're still moving in the Vienna Convention, but th these are the sort of soft limits that you will see in there. And that the dynamic interpretations should take account of the fundamental principles of international law, which often promoted and uh, even initiated by these organizations themselves. 
These uh, dynamic interpretations should not violate use cogents <coughs> and fundamental internationally uh, protected fundamental human rights. And then one of the things which is important is that these uh, evolutive interpretations uh, sh should take account of the function of other international organizations. We have so many international organizations, they all each have useful functions and this is something that they could not move on each other's turf and sort of absorb one into the other. And the final paragraph, in fact, brings back this resolution, back to the legislative history of the charter that I mentioned to you, which says that unless otherwise provided in the constituent instruments of international organizations, when there is a general agreement among the membership of the international organization as, an, as to an interpretation, the interpretation should be presumed to be valid and intra-virus. So that is the final statement on the, on the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Manoush, on this uh, very comprehensive presentation of uh, our resolution. Maintenant, je me tourne vers ma gauche. Euh, et je vais donner la parole à Fausto Pocar, qui a été le dernier rapporteur dans la question des, du droit international privé et les droits de la personne humaine. Euh, je parle en français parce que cette question a fait l'objet des vifs débats « How to translate human rights in French <rire> ?» euh, et la question a été tranchée de ce point de vue-là, euh, droit international privé et droit de la personne humaine. Fausto, tu as la parole, uh, whatever language you wish to use. Yes, we can English, but first uh, let me um, pay tribute to uh, our Secretary General for organizing this meeting. It's the first time that the Institute does organizes a meeting like this with the resolutions uh, open to the public, a discussion with the public. Um, of course, the resolutions are discussed in different fora, each resolution, but uh, a, a, a global consideration of the activity in a session uh, is not, uh, was not done in the past. This is the first time it, uh, it happens, so I think it's a good uh, initiative. Uh, now, uh, this topic of human rights and private international law is a mm, relatively easy topic or difficult topic. Um, I wish to go back to the beginning of this institute. When the institute was founded, many, a good part of the founders were private international lawyers mainly not public international, there were public international lawyers, but most were private international lawyers. And indeed the activity in the first years was very much in private international law. Uh, progressively, the Institute, uh, the number of public international lawyers uh, increased. But what is uh, more uh, uh, important is that the specialization of the branches of international law progressively increased too. And uh, now the Institute has these two components. Uh, we try always to keep a balance between the two components, private international law, public international lawyers, but frequently the uh, activity, the resolution, remains uh, to a large extent uh, within the field of public international law or private international law, mainly public international law, because the number of international lawyers is clearly much uh, uh, greater than the number of public of private international lawyers. This topic is halfway, because uh, indeed most of the uh, experts of international human rights are public international lawyers, essentially. Are work in public international law, and uh, uh, there are only a few private international lawyers uh, have addressed uh, the issue of human rights, although increasingly in the last year this has uh, happened. There are more uh, 
monograph studies uh, in private and national and human rights. This topic then is uh, halfway, I say, between the components. And uh, for this reason, it's what not really easy to deal with it. Because uh, uh, there is inevitably, on one side, the, uh, the approach to give more weight to the private public international component. On the other side, uh, we know private international law uh, has many technicalities, uh, maybe more than public international law. And uh, there is uh, inevitably the, the experts in that, um, in that area tend to insist on these uh, technicalities. Um, the, I say this because uh, uh, when the, the discussion came on this topic, on a report that was drafted by a colleague of private international law, Professor Bazelov, and it was an excellent report, I must say, but the discussion on the resolution was more, most uh, difficult. At the point that uh, my, my friend, uh, my colleague, um, Professor Bazidov, decided to give up and not to work anymore on the topic. So the Bureau was confronted with uh, a strange situation to uh, find somebody to continue, not to make another report, because it would have been difficult to, to do that, but just to go for a resolution, finding a way to compromise between the two components. And the choice of the Bureau was <laughs> myself. Uh, now, I happen in my life to have to compromise between public and private international law all my life with myself because I work in both fields all the time. But uh, yes, I took the task, uh, it went well, maybe because uh, the session was online and uh, <laughs> the, the confrontation was more difficult <laughs> between the participants. But uh, in any case, I cannot say it was more, uh, it was probably easier to compromise with myself than to compromise with the, with the group. Uh, uh, now we have a resolution on this, on this topic. The resolution does not want to uh, make progress in private international law. It does not want to make progress on human rights law. It tries to find a balance between the needs of private international law and the uh, protection of, uh, of uh, uh, human rights. Uh, this is already stated clearly in the, um, in the recitals of the preambular part, where it says that uh, the obligations to protect human rights go in any field and uh, uh, belong uh, to the domestic sphere or the cross-border relations of the state. And we know they belong also to activity, external activity completely of a state abroad. So it's a, uh, it's a, a notion that of human rights that does not belong to a specific field, but belong to all fields of activity. And uh, the idea was that uh, uh, private international law can contribute to the interpretation and implementation of human rights, uh, especially by ensuring respect for plurality of traditions, cultures, and legal systems. So find a way of uh, uh, helping the protection of human rights in that, uh, in that respect. But uh, the first problem was to define human rights, or better, the holder of human rights. Because uh, uh, we know in human rights law, uh, there are many conventions, there are many instruments. I will not mention them, of course. But uh, the, the holders of human rights are all human beings, essentially. But the real problem that emerged are legal persons holders of human rights. 
That was a big problem to be resolved. And it was resolved in the easiest way possible, not to give anything, not to say anything on the point, <laughs> but uh, with the idea that uh, uh, if uh, we define human rights referring to all the instruments, the main instruments, international instruments on human rights, uh, this uh, will be, have to be interpreted. If state A interprets this, including legal persons, uh, they will be applicable without the necessity for the institute to make a, a, a definition of that. That is what I said before. It is not the idea to resolve a problem which is a human rights problem uh, and not a private international law problem. Private international law, uh, we, is, uh, we said simply that legal persons are obliged to respect human rights as any other entity, as a state, any other uh, organization uh, has, to, uh, has to respect uh, human rights. And we want to stress that the duty to respect the human rights also by a specific provision, Article 19, in which it said that corporations have to respect uh, human rights. Um, the other point that was important to resolve was the problem of non-discrimination. We all know that uh, the principle of non-discrimination is the basic principle of human rights. It's enough to read the, the Universal Declaration, the Covenants, to, uh, to perceive this point. And uh, the, when a, a rule has to combine more systems of law, the problem is effectively to avoid the discriminations because applying one or applying the other, you may discriminate depending on the situation. So the principle of discrimination must be the guiding principle throughout private international law. And uh, uh, together with that principle, you have the principle of uh, the protection, the access to justice in order to, uh, to have the protection of law. And private international law can he uh, has a lot of problems that are connected with that. Jurisdiction. Are there rules of human rights in jurisdiction? The real rule is the access to justice. You cannot uh, exercise jurisdiction in private matters in a way that uh, the, you arrive at a denial of justice. So we adopted a rule in which uh, we said jurisdiction must be based on factual criteria connected with the case and not with abstract criteria that have no connection whatever with, the, with this concrete situation. But at the same time, if uh, the rule may lead to a denial of justice, a court may depart from this uh, connection and exercise jurisdiction in a given case to ensure that uh, the rule of law is uh, uh, respected. So uh, this is the, the, the main philosophy of all the resolution. I cannot go through all the provisions because we'll be going through all private, uh, private methods. But there are some points that may need to be, uh, to be uh, recalled here. And uh, because they depend on culture, essentially. And the, the main principle in family matters, for instance, in private matters concerning family, concerning children, concerning the, the life, the private life of individuals, the main principle that has been uh, accepted is the principle of recognition. In principle, a, a system of private institutional law should not uh, go to uh, against what other cultures accept uh, in these matters and recognize the situations as decided according to other cultures. For instance, the legal capacity, the personal status of a person has, depends really on the law applicable in a given situation. There are situations in which you can correct, of course, is because we have 
traditionally in private international law, the concept of public policy, and you are not obliged to apply a foreign law for a foreign, to a foreign situation if it goes against the, uh, the foreign policy. Although the foreign policy tends to be more and more not the foreign policy of the state of the forum, but an international concept of uh, uh, private of uh, public policy. So there are these two notions, private and, uh, and public notion of uh, public policy. And uh, uh, there is always this possibility of not recognizing as a limit of recognition to the public policy uh, if there is a confrontation. But there are situations in which it was difficult to make a decision. And the main situation in which this happened was polygamy. Has polygamy to be recognized or should be regarded as contrary to public policy? There was a, a big discussion in the Institute, and at the end, the Institute came to the conclusion not to deal with polygamy. <laughs> not, because, not because of uh, uh, leaving it out, but uh, uh, there was a, a years before there had been a, in, a, in a resolution adopted in, the, in Basel many years ago, a, a point in a resolution which recognized polygamy, or seemed to recognize polygamy, accepting at least was on different culture, this resolution. And uh, uh, the main uh, position was to accept that polygamy could be accepted, not to be rejected in all cases in particular. Um, on this matter, I, the Institute decided that human rights law requires recognition of marriages based on the free and full consent of two spouses. Say it's two spouses. So if there is full consent of two spouses, this, there is no problem. But of course, these two spouses may occur <laughs> more times. I mean, one of the spouses is the same, and the other spouse is different. I mean, this couple, you may have this couple in many situations, different situations. And this has been left out, of course. What has been banned is absolutely contrary to, public policy, to, to the principles is child marriage and marriage concluded in the absence on free and full consent of the spouses. This, we said, should not be recognized. But there are two. One must be careful. Because uh, recogn not recognizing this kind of marriages, where certainly cannot be recognized as such, uh, may create problems for the persons that are victims of these marriages. And so we adopted a rule that in interpreting the imperative rules, the public policy, not allowing the recognition, you have to uh, take into account all the circumstances of the case, with a view to avoiding undesirable effects on the rights of the child, on the right of the forced victim. For instance, you have a case of uh, uh, succession. You had a marriage uh, that is, cannot be recognized as such. Should you say that uh, the child that was uh, the spouse and didn't give consent is not entitled to the succession if the husband dies you should accept accept the ground of succession because it will be punishing the victim so it, can, it, can, it doesn't make sense so it's uh, it's clear that uh, this uh, uh, this uh, situation although it was discussed but in reality makes sense that a court seized with the question where you say marriage is not recognized but for the purposes of the succession is a valid title of succession so it's uh, uh, I thought it would be uh, logical to to go in the sense um, i won't say more because we don't have much time here 
that, uh, of course, if there are questions, we will go through. One issue that I want only to mention, also because it goes back to the beginning of the Institute activity, is that uh, on many issues, the resolutions um, uh, pass a sort of judgment on existing conventions on human rights. And uh, if it uh, considered that they were uh, in conformity with principles of human rights, uh, encouraged states to ratify these conventions. So instead of creating new rules, say ratify the convention that uh, they protect the human rights in, in a good way. And this, this is mainly the Hague Conventions on uh, Private International Law. And the, the, the Institute started with the, together with the Conference of Private International Law. It was uh, also gave, uh, was uh, essential for starting the Conference of Private International Law because it was Professor Asser who, who pushed for it. Thank you. Thank you, Fausto, for this very interesting presentation. And this is a very nice example of the manner in which the Institute addresses issues relating to both private international law and public international law. With regard to the presentation of the work of the Institute, I have to say that uh, this is not the first time that we organize uh, the, present, the public presentation of our work. So since uh, Tallinn 2015, we did so in New York and in Geneva later, but it was for the Secretary General only to present all the resolutions. So probably this is the manner in which uh, the life of the Secretary General is easier. <laughs> because uh, and no one better than the rapporteur to present the work of their commissions. So, uh, without further ado, I give the floor to Alexandro Sicilianos, who was the rapporteur also on this very important uh, topic, which is also a, a current important uh, situation in the world, which is the international administration. Uh, by the United Nations or the territorial administration by the United Nations or other authorized institutions. Alexander. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcello. And I would like to warmly thank you personally and the Graduate Institute for organizing this, this event and for inviting me to, to take part. Um, I have been rapporteur on this issue of uh, international administration since 2015. There has been a first discussion during the Tallinn session. And then I submitted my preliminary report and questionnaire at the Hague session in 2019, and finally my final report and draft resolution in 2021 during the online session. And uh, uh, this final uh, report is organized in the form of uh, article by article commentary um, of uh, the resolution. The resolution was adopted almost unanimously, and I would like to warmly thank also the members of the Institute here present for their, for their kind support. The first question I would like to raise is why this resolution? The reply is that there has been no prior attempts to codify the existing practice in respect of international administration of territories. There is a need to clarify the legal regime of international administration to enhance UN accountability and to make proposals so as to strengthen the protection of human rights and the rule of law in this uh, framework. The preamble to the resolution emphasizes all those elements, the temporary and transitional nature of international administration regimes, as well as the fact that the ultimate beneficiary of the process must, must be the population or people concerned. This is a light motif of the whole resolution. This is an idea that comes again and again. So these are the main ideas behind the elaboration of uh, the resolution accountability, protection of human rights, um, and, uh, and uh, also emphasize uh, the, the temporary transitional nature of the ad administration of, uh, of territories and the fact that the ultimate beneficiary should be the, the, uh, the people concerned. My next point concerns the scope of the resolution. And this is chapter one of the resolution, the scope of the resolution. The resolution applies when the administration is exercised either by the United Nations themselves, like in Kosovo, East Timor, for instance, or by another international organization authorized by the United Nations, like in Bosnia. 
The main question is, however, whether we follow a strict approach of the notion of administration or a broader approach. And the Institute has opted for the broader approach. The resolution applies, A, when the international institution substitutes itself for a state in exercising all powers of public authority, like in Kosovo or East Timor, but the resolution also applies in relation to supervisory regimes, that is, in cases where the United Nations or another international institution exercises specific powers uh, of public authority for the purpose of supervising national institutions, like in Cambodia, for instance. So we have two scenarios here. We have the substitution uh, regime and we have the supervisory regimes. But the resolution does not apply to technical assistant missions. This is a clear cut point and is specifically said in the resolution, technical assistance does not amount to administration. The next issue I would like to touch upon relates to the basis, the legal basis, the foundation of international territorial administration. And this is the chapter two of uh, uh, the resolution. First of all, the resolution proclaims the general principle of legality. The founding act of the administration regime and its mandate have to be in conformity with the United Nations Charter and eventually with the constitutive instruments of any other international organization involved. Uh, there is also a legitimacy issue, namely the temporary and transitional character of international administration, as well as the fact, as I said before, that the ultimate beneficiary should be and is always the people concerned. As a matter of legal basis, the resolution makes a distinction between regimes established with the consent of the interested parties and those established unilaterally by the UN Security Council, so consensual and unilateral uh, um, uh, regimes. The consensual regimes are based mainly on an agreement which is normally endorsed afterwards by the United Nations. The imposed regimes are based on a relevant resolution by the UN Security Council, uh, mainly under Chapter 7 of the Charter. If the Security Council authorizes another international organization, then Chapter 8 may also apply. Finally, um, Article 6 of the resolution also envisages uh, the mere participation of an international institution in an administration regime established by the United Nations, like the uh, European Union and the OSCE in Kosovo, for instance. We all know that EU and OSCE were participating, were helping, were assisting the UNMIC in, in Kosovo. So this, this kind of scenario is also envisaged in Article 6 of the resolution. I turn now to the most difficult issue, the issue of the rules applicable to international administration regime, and this is the, the object of chapter three of the resolution. The resolution defines the different sets of rules applicable and the relationship between them. Without entering into the details, I would like to mention first the mandate. The mandate shall govern the exercise of powers of public authority by the international body. It should be as specific as possible. Then you have local law, but the question is what do you understand by local law? In substitution regimes, in cases where the international body substitutes itself to the state, then local law denotes the temporary legal order put in place by the international body. Let me give an example, the regulations by UNMIC, for instance. The UNMIC has introduced, has adopted such regulations, introducing thereby a provisional legal order, which was part of the local law in the understanding of the notion by uh, the Institute. Treaties are also applicable, but attention, to the extent they are binding for the international body. The international body is not automatically bound by each and every treaty concluded before the establishment of the administration regime. 
General international law applies also subject to the provisions of a mandate adopted by the Security Council under Chapter 7 of the Charter, meaning that the Security Council may, on a case-by-case -case basis, deviate from specific provisions of general international law, but, of course, peremptory rules have to be respected under any circumstances. Finally, the provisions of the fourth Geneva Convention on the Protection of Civilians may be applied by analogy and on a supplementary basis. In other words, the law applicable to international administration regimes is quite complex and includes distinct sets of rules. The mandate, local law, international treaties, general international law, including peremptory norms, and IHL, International Humanitarian Law. I come now to a very important chapter of the resolution, chapter four, which focuses on human rights protection. The purpose of this chapter is to strengthen human rights protection under the international administration regime. It contains a series of recommendations. Some of them are based on existing practice, others constitute progressive development of international law. For instance, the mandate should specify the standards of human rights protection where appropriate with reference to the main international treaty instruments in this field. Both the international body and local institutions should apply those standards. The resolution draws inspiration from the case law of the European Court of Human Rights in this respect. Furthermore, the international body should enter into specific arrangements so as to enable the relevant treaty bodies to monitor the observance of human rights standards. There is a precedent in this respect. UMIC has submitted a report to the Human Rights Committee, thereby enabling the Human Rights Committee to monitor the implementation of the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Analogous practices could and should perhaps be developed. Derogations from international instruments are possible, of course, but they should be expressly provided for in the mandate. No derogations are permitted in respect of peremptory rules of general international law relating to human rights. The last chapter of the resolution concerns supervision and accountability. It tends to cover serious gaps, serious lacunae in existing practice. The resolution affirms the privileges and immunities of international organizations, including, of course, the United Nations. At the same time, the resolution calls for the establishment of specific mechanisms for supervising compliance with human rights standards. It calls also for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. This is an idea drawn from the Headquarters Agreement of the United Nations and other international organizations. It can also be found in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Some relevant mechanisms have indeed been established in practice, like the Ombudsperson in Kosovo, for instance. But they are exceptional and their efficiency is questionable. At this point, I would like to emphasize that the issue of supervision and accountability is a more general issue. It transcends international administration regimes. It concerns peace operations in general, as well as multinational forces authorized by the United Nations. Finally, the resolution contains a provision on international responsibility clarifying the set of rules applicable in this context, and especially the rules on attribution and shared responsibility. It refers mainly to the IMC articles on responsibility of international organizations, but also to the articles on state responsibility as far as uh, states uh, participating in multinational forces authorized by the UN Security Council. Uh, the resolution recalls, uh, uh, finally, the, the advisory function of the ICJ, especially in case of complex issues related to the interpretation of the mandate um, of international administration regime. To conclude, I would like to say that the resolution on international administration of territories is a mix of codification of existing practice and, and progressive development of international law. 
It tends to clarify the conceptual framework uh, of international administration regimes and the applicable rules. It also aims at strengthening human rights protection as well as accountability of the United Nations and other international institutions authorized by the United Nations. More generally, it raises a series of issues which are also relevant in respect of operations going beyond administration, peacekeeping operations, peace building operations, peace enforcing operations, authorized operations, a vast array of Security Council and other uh, uh, organizations activities in the field of peace and security. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Merci beaucoup, Alexandra. Je pense que vous avez pu apprécier la richesse des travaux de notre institut lors de sa 80e session en ligne. Uh, I would also like to draw your attention that um, you can consult the preparatory work that uh, led to the adoption of these four resolutions in the last volume of the Annuaire de l'Institut de Droit International. Uh, you can, in particular, you can read the reports uh, elaborated by our colleagues. And you can also read the deliberations uh, of the Institute uh, last year in the forthcoming uh, volume of the Annuaire, uh, which uh, will appear uh, this uh, summer. So now we have uh, some time for questions. Uh, I have to say that we can only take questions uh, from the audience here in person, so I apologize for this to those who are following us uh, online. So uh, if you are willing to uh, raise a question or make a short comment, uh, please raise your hand and you can do it either in English or in French both working languages who is with maybe i should fill the silence so um, please thanks for uh, you excellent. you will receive the microphone in a moment thank, thank you. you i thought somebody somebody should take the initiative so why not me excellent. so thank you very much for uh, this invitation and it's very nice to sort of uh, listen to live discussions which happened at the Institute beyond the annual air. So it was a very good uh, exchange. Thank you very much. My uh, question is for, for Judge Cecilianos about uh, the scope of international administration. So what was really in mind? And why I pose that question is specifically in the context of the Security Council resolutions for suppression of piracy off the coast of Somalia. So that's the situation where uh, the, the right of the coastal state over the territorial sea was suspended with the rights of the, of the uh, members of the Security Council to provide security in that region and, in a sense, to administer that. Of course, for a limited period of time and which was eventually extended. So I'm curious whether this is a facet which was covered by the scope of international administration or was there a notion of a full-fledged administration rather than something which is partial in this context, because this is not a full administration, but just partial to support the transitional government in Somalia through uh, Chapter 7 resolutions. My second question is for, for Professor Pokar. It's not about uh, polygamy. Uh, <laughs> it's about um, uh, but simpler things. One of the core principles of private international law is forum non-convenience and forum non-convenience. And it's so regular and normal that uh, courts do say we won't go on with this trial because we are not the convenient forum. Now, as I understood, that one of the first principles was there should be no denial of justice. And I'm curious that this frame of denial of justice would be applied to each jurisdiction, because if it is applied, then the court could probably say that, well, uh, we can't decline jurisdiction on the basis of forum, forum non-convenience because the whole premise of private international law is you can go to one court or another. You can't impose that I wish to go to one court or another. And I wonder how is this aspect taken into account into the first uh, principle that you spoke about access to justice? Thank you. Thank you. You want to answer? No. Uh, well, 
Thank you very, very much for, for this question. We have actively debated this issue of the scope of the resolution within the 13th uh, uh, Commission. And it is true that it was conceptually not, not an easy task. Um, the initial approach was to focus only on the so-called substitution regimes. This is, this is the most clear case, let us say, of administration. You have an international body which substitutes itself to a state or a, a non-state uh, non entity, a territorial entity, let us say, and then you have a full-fledged administration regime. Uh, um, and then we said that perhaps we should also deal with, with other, other scenarios. And uh, that's why we decided finally to enlarge the scope so as to uh, um, uh, encompass uh, uh, the supervision uh, regime. Now, uh, uh, and we have had as a dividing line, let us say, the, uh, the distinction between technical assistance support on the one hand and on the other hand, the supervision, uh, but heavy supervision, like it was done in, in, in Cambodia, for instance. And, and um, uh, this, is, this is what we have decided. Now, I understand that uh, the case you refer to is a borderline case. It, it, can, uh, it, it can go uh, either way. It can go either way, depending the, the, how you, you, you see uh, support. You see support as a, as a, as a form of uh, supervision. Uh, you see support as a form of technical assistance. It, it's a borderline case. So uh, um, personally, I was in favor of a broader approach of the, the scope of uh, the resolution. And it is said there is a provision therein. It is said that even when the um, resolution does not strictly apply, then the rules and the principles could be applied by analogy to other uh, uh, more or less similar scenario. Uh, so the, the compromise solution we have found uh, was to include this, this um, uh, uh, invitation uh, of relevant uh, institutions to draw inspiration from the resolution, even when the resolution is not strictly speaking applicable uh, to, to, to a given scenario. So this would be my... my uh, Provisional reply to your question. Thank you so much. Well, the forum non convenience is uh, one of the uh, difficult questions of uh, jurisdiction, of course. Um, common law accepts for the doctrine of forum non convenience, civil law does not, in principle at least. Uh, there are attempts to bridge the systems. There is one attempt now going on at The Hague uh, to try to find rules of jurisdiction combining the two systems, but it's very difficult to do it. The uh, Institute did not try to do this, of course, because it was not uh, the object of this, of this resolution. It was dealing with human rights um, and not with jurisdiction in general. So the only principle that uh, we stated in the resolution is that heads of jurisdiction in international cases, cross-border cases, shall be based upon substantial connections with the case of the parties thereto, taking into consideration the human rights to access to court. So uh, we uh, gave, uh, as a principle, uh, discouraged those kind of criteria, uh, connections that are not really connected with the case that are used in many, in many jurisdictions uh, uh, nowadays as well, that have no real connection with the, uh, with the dispute. Um, and then we dealt with the denial of justice. So uh, clearly, a, a country where foreign non-convenience is accepted can use the mechanism for non-convenience also, because it says, well, uh, this uh, this forum is not convenient, and so I take. But it's reverse. I take jurisdiction because that forum is not convenient. A forum that would be convenient, would be competent, is not convenient because it leads to a denial of justice. Uh, that's the way, in a way, the the, the system is put together. But uh, there is no clear the decision on using one or the other criteria, because you may have two situations, a situation in which both forums are convenient, because both, and you have to decide what is preferable in the case. This is not allowed 
by civil law countries. You cannot do it. A judge cannot do it. Mm -hmm. Has the rule and has to apply it. Uh, in uh, common law countries, you have this possibility in a, in a given case to say, well, uh, here that my forum is not more, you do with your forum normally, my forum is not the convenient one, so go elsewhere to litigate. Uh, it's a question of flexibility of the systems, but not, uh, not more than that, I think. Thank you. Is there any final uh, question? May, may I add a, yes, a footnote to uh, this provision? And uh, I would like to mention uh, a, a case of uh, the um, uh, plenary of the European Court of Human Rights, Knight Lehman uh, versus Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, there was a, a Tunisian uh, national which was uh, allegedly tortured in Tunisia many years ago in the 90s, and then he uh, um, became a refugee in Switzerland, and finally he uh, was granted uh, the, the Swiss nationality. And then he filed uh, a, a petition, a complaint, against, uh, against the Tunisia before uh, um, um, Swiss courts, and the case arrived before the Tribunal Federal, and the federal tribunal said that it um, uh, invoked the, the forum non convenience and then the, the uh, uh, forum necessitatis, which is also yeah. invoked in Article 4 of yeah. our resolution. And it said that there was not a substantive link with, with uh, this case before, because the person was allegedly tortured before. Uh, he became a refugee in Switzerland, before he was a resident in Switzerland, before he became a national of Switzerland. So by that time, the critical time being the 90s, the 1990s, there was no substantive link between him and, uh, and Switzerland. And uh, um, finally, the case arrived before the European Court of Human Rights, and the European Court, albeit with certain hesitations and caveats, uh, said that there was no violation of Article 6 of the Convention, of the European Convention of Human Rights, meaning no violation of the right to access to court. Uh, but it was a very, very difficult case, and we must say that uh, we very much hesitated before arriving to this conclusion. Um, I say we, should, we because I, I also participated in composition of this case. So I, I very vividly remember this case of 2018. You may wish to, to have a look at Knight Lehman versus Switzerland. Uh, thank you. That, that's thank interesting, you. but if one adopted Article 4 of the resolution on foreign necessity, what has <laughs> said, if you go to Tunisia now, you will not have uh, your case dealt with, so uh, we take uh, take uh, jurisdiction. But, but the resolution not was necessarily. Not this was a factual yes. element, not necessarily because the procedure was uh, reintroduced in Switzerland under the actual regime. Ah, okay. So <laughs> there was there was also this. Sorry, was this uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there are some <laughs> temporal <laughs> issues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But we don't have time to discuss that. No. There is just room for one more question, please. Interesting. Yeah. Donc, je vais y aller une question en français. Ce serait pour Madame Arsanjani. Euh, donc, j'ai lu avec attention votre rapport et puis la, la résolution également. Et puis, je me demandais, ça a été abordé un petit peu, mais j'ai bien l'impression que l'Institut ne voulait pas non plus aller trop là-dedans. Mais par rapport à la différence ou la limite peut-être entre la modification de facto et l'interprétation évolutive ou dynamique, donc euh, il y a l'exemple notable que vous mettez, puis il y en a plusieurs dans le rapport, par exemple celle du veto au Conseil de sécurité, etc. Donc est-ce que vous diriez que toute cette interprétation évolutive, et puis on, on met tout ça dans une catégorie, ou est-ce qu'il y aurait vraiment deux catégories, et est-ce qu'on doit tracer une ligne pour savoir justement qu'est-ce qui relève de l'interprétation, puis qu'est-ce qui relève de la, la modification Donc, euh, merci. Now, with my poor French, I'm not going to respond in French, but I want to make sure that I understood your question well, is that the, the evolutive or the dynamic interpretation is what, what you're asking is that whether it could be, it could, it, it, it could result to an amendment. Yeah, is it if, a, if, is if there's... Perspective, is a is, is a de facto amendment. It could result to a de facto amendment. If you, it is, you know, it's interesting. I, I, 
specifically emphasize that you have to bear in mind that the kind of institutions, international institutions that we're talking about, they're a part of, of a particular period in our history. So there were different expectations of how these universal organizations could operate. So the, the, the principle of voluntary cooperation and consent, this uh, cooperation of the member states to the direction that the organization was, is moving was an important. If you read the report, you will see that many of the uh, sort of uh, dynamic interpretation that was conducted actually was a de facto, it was de facto amendment. And that is because the amendment procedure of the charter is so complicated that it's almost, almost with the exception of a few that they did, it's almost impossible to amend the charter. If you want to write, just bear in mind the history in which we're living now, the international relations, there's no way you could come up among the states with something like the charter that was drafted after World War II. I don't believe that we, can, we have reached the, the history point where we can actually agree on a common, uh, on a universal uh, international treaty of that, of that importance. I'm not even sure that at this time, if we were to draft the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court, we could have agreed on it. That I think these are just a specific period that happens in history, which lend itself to drafting a treaty. Thank God that we do have the charter, but the expectations of how the charter was going to work was very different. The consent of the membership, and I said not unanimity, but the general acceptance of the membership was essential. And that you will see there, there are, there are um, uh, interpretive, there are dynamic interpretations that amends to, uh, to actually amendment, and that is understood. But it's okay, you can go because you have not amended the charter. You know, if you, if you can still reinterpret what you have interpreted that amounts to the de facto amendment. So the fluidity of the, the process is, is it still is maintained. I don't know if I answered your question, but that is... Yeah, I think you did. I was wondering if we have to draw a line or not, but uh, I feel we don't uh, with, with that answer. <laughs> I think it's fluid. I, yeah. I think <laughs> you okay. have to say this. So, merci beaucoup. So, avant de clore uh, cette uh, séance, uh, donc j'insiste, je vous rappelle que notre prochaine session aura lieu à Angers, en France, uh, pour la session du 150e anniversaire de notre institut, et ce sera sous la présidence de notre confrère uh, Alain Pellet. So, uh, I would kindly ask you to join me to congratulate and to thank our for rapporteur for their work uh, at the Institute and for this uh, clear presentation of uh, our work. Thank you very much. And now um, you, you are kindly invited uh, for a cocktail that uh, I think it will be upstairs. And we can continue the discussions at that moment.